Hello, Tudor-minded people. It's Philadelphia Carey for Tudor Time Machine. The expression I share with you this week is smell smock. This phrase invokes a most clear and vivid image of those men who hound us of the gentler sex. My friends, I confess a lady of my rank would not often let such an expression cross her lips. You might hear it bandied about in the streets of London, amongst those who must work for a living, by a butcheress or a bakeress or a candlestick makeress. <laughs> now, at court, we might use womanizer, or perhaps the Greek, philogenist. Yet smell smock is more to the point. My ningles. Have we not all cringed at the man who is always a pandering and a grimacing and a leering? Have we not suffered the eye that removes one's gown, bodice, stomacher and smock? Or a nasty nose that boldly hankers after one's sweet perfume? If the gentleman is of a high rank, one must titter and hide one's distaste behind one's fan, or sham a fainting spell to escape. In truth, we would fain cry out, Away with you, villain! Oh, piss off, thou nasty smell smock! Smell smock! How now, Tudor Files? What think you? If you're new here, I'm Gage. I'm Jessica. And we're here with Philadelphia Carey for Tudor Word of the Week. Don't miss a word and listen to the Tudor Time Machine Story Project. So diverting. And I pray bid you tell a ningle. And ring the little YouTube bell. Da, 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 da. Tudor Files, thank you for listening. Every one of you has the wit of Rosalind and the heart of Cordelia. And don't be shy about writing to Philadelphia on YouTube or suggesting words. We love hearing from you. How do you spell our Tudor phrase of the week, Philadelphia? It is spelled S M E L L S M O C K. And the modern equivalent of this word would be mm, panty sniffer. <laughs> Yikes. Yes, I guess that's right. <laughs> well, I mean, it is what it is, right? <laughs> it's true. The phrase smell smock would have been as shockingly graphic to the Tudor ear as panty sniffer is to us. In my time travels, I have seen these panties you speak of. They are a most cunning item. I do love the way the cloth of which they are made stretches out and bounces back into place. Oh, miraculous. Elastic was a game changer. When first I saw them, I was sure they were to adorn the head, not to wear under one's clothes. I would like to have seen that, Philadelphia. You with a pair of Victoria's Secret pink sparkly underwear on your head, like a little hat. <laughs> we are in a silly <laughs> mood today. But Philadelphia, tell us more about these smocks. My mingle. One's smock is a most intimate piece of clothing. We also call it a shift or chemise. One's lady's maid helps one put it over one's head, and then she helps one don the other layers, the petticoat, the kirtle, and finally, the gown. And what if one does not have a lady's maid? Then you have to struggle into all those layers by oneself? Oh, I suppose so. It makes one shudder to think on it. Also, my smocks are always made of fine, soft linen with cunning blackwork embroidery at the throat. But I have heard that women of lesser rank must wear smocks of coarse stuff, even homespun. Oh, how rough that must feel against the skin. Intolerable. Oh, so intolerable. Thank goodness you are spared that, Philadelphia. Well, the smock was a practical idea because they could actually be washed very easily and the material would absorb sweat and it would protect the outer garments that were made of much finer or heavier material. The tutors sometimes get a bad name for not washing their clothes, but the smock was washed really often. For upper class ladies like Philadelphia, it certainly would have been washed every day and you would have changed it every day. It was only the outer garments that weren't washed. And actually, because it was made of jacquard or velvet, wool, 
The gown was brushed and rubbed with a damp cloth, but not submerged in water, sort of like how you would take care of a very, very nice wool coat or a jacquard coat if you have one. Anyway, where does our use of the expression smell smock come from, Philadelphia? It comes from a play by Master Thomas Decker called The Honest Whore, Part Two. The Honest Whore, Part One, was a collaboration between Decker and Thomas Middleton. But scholars think the second part was written by Decker alone. The first part was performed in 1604, probably at the Blackfriars Theater by the Lord Admiral's Men. I read it. It isn't really written with the idea of needing a sequel. So it must have been extremely popular to inspire a part two. Well, then is now. The play is a city comedy, but it takes place in Italy. Part one is about a prostitute, Bellafont, who is inspired to have a change of heart about her profession when she encounters the noble Hippolyto, and he delivers this kind of soul-crushing speech at her, and he shames her about her way of life. To make herself an honest woman again, she creates a complicated stratagem to get Matteo, the man who she lost her virginity to, to marry her, even though Matteo is kind of a horrible person. Well, that's weird. Yeah, I mean, it's all super Tudor patriarchal stuff because then in part two, Hippolyto, I guess he doesn't have anything better to do. So he decides to test Bellafont to see if she's steadfast about her new life. And he tries to seduce her. She, however, is faithful to her horrible alcoholic gaming and violent husband. Yay! I <laughs> know. And also her father, who cut her off because of her sinful life and thinks she should have killed herself instead of lived on, now comes to test her newfound goodness as a faithful wife to the horrible husband. So the father and the husband just hate each other. And the use of our expression comes in a fight between the two of them. Let's act it out, Philadelphia. Oh, with pleasure. The father says... Thou keepest a man of mine here under my nose. And the husband says, under thy beard. As errant a smell smock for an old mutton monger as thyself. No, as yourself. As errant a purse taker as ever cried, stand. Yet a good fellow, I confess, and valiant. But he'll bring thee to the gallows. You both have robbed of late two poor country peddlers. How is this? How is this? Dost thou fly high, rob peddlers, bear witness, my man and I are fate? I thought I'd just change up the accent there. <laughs> the good Bellifont breaks up this brabble. At the end of the play, she's reconciled to her father, and she stays true to her miscreant of a husband. And that passed for a happy ending in the Tudor period. And is very disturbing to us, just <laughs> like... The word smell smock? <laughs> Absolutely. But attitudes like undergarments change with the times. Oh, neatly said, my Ningle Gage. So take heed, Tudor Files. Bring some 16th century source to your vocabulary with smell smock. Listen in next time. Don't miss a word. Subscribe on YouTube and give me a like. <laughs>